going to talk about something that is pretty awesome. I don't know if it's awesome for everyone, but it's awesome for me because India has the second largest population in the world. And when the leftists lose in India, you get to see butthurt among the second largest population of leftists in the world, which is pretty funny. And the fact is, if you need, if you need an example of left-wingers and progressives who can't accept the fact that nobody wants their janky, lazy, loser policies, all you have to do is look at a country like India, and you can see that the leader of the of the main opposition party, a guy who is, you know, the he's the representative of the of the family that's ruled India for much of its history, the Gandhi Nehru family. And he's a pretty, you know, corrupt net leftist, just like all of them become. Rahul Gandhi is 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 done. He lost his his seat in Amethi by 55,000 votes. Can you believe that? And what's another result of this is that there is no more representative party of the left in India that can really claim that it's, you know, representing the alternative to the BJP. Now, let me clear up something first before we go on. I really don't have any insight into who really deserves to run India because the closest I, uh, I've ever come to India is working with a lot of people from there. And to be honest with you, most Indian Americans don't seem to be very politically involved anyway. So I wouldn't know whether people like it here. I certainly think that over there, People really like this Narendra Modi guy. But we're going to talk today a little bit more about some of the, the weirdos that can't accept Narendra Modi. So first, we're going to, we're going to look at something that I love about India, which is the, the Trash Talk TV. So get a load of this. Us live uh, at this moment. Mr. Sarma, congratulations uh, to you and your party. It looks like the BJP may do even better than it did in the 2014 election. Big day for you. Yes, uh, I think this is a big thumbs up for Prime Minister Modi. We are surely doing better than 2014. Mr. Uh, I've just had breaking news that the Congress party regrets everything and wants to come to you and ask you for some advice. <laughs> They're going to come and meet you and ask you for some advice. And so th this is hilarious. You have people in the newsroom who are talking crap about one of the political parties that's losing. And I'll, 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 uh, I'll, uh, I'll advise them to give a decent retirement to Rahul Gandhi. Ouch. <laughs> Ouch. But and then you'll rewrite his, you'll rewind history and you'll join them again. Yeah, yeah, so this is pretty much, I actually work with a guy who talks exactly like the guy over here, and, and he, he does give, like, backhanded insults like that. But what about who are of the political left? How are they reacting? Here is Arundhati Roy talking about Narendra Modi for the CBC, which is, I mean, the CBC is, like, publicly su subsidized butthurt at this point over in Canada. Sorry for all of you guys. I hate the kind of person that your whore mother turned me into. Well, I don't believe them. I can't tell whether I'm just being delusional, stubborn, ridiculous. Dennis, your mother is a dirty, dirty whore. Oh, God damn it. You know, but I, I think that they're going to lose. Still, I think they're going to lose. I mean, no one's going to win. I, I don't think anyone's going to win. I think they're going to be. A lot of negotiations. I don't know, honestly. I mean, my 
uh, instinct says that the exit polls are wrong, but maybe I'm wrong, you know. Maybe one's so anxious that one just can't believe it. I don't know. I just can't believe this. Hey, Dad, keep your you voice whore! Yeah, what's your part number? Part number 150. So notice this. They did the same thing with Brazil. They said the real reason people chose something besides retarded leftism isn't because people are tired of it. It has nothing to do with the fact that people like the guy in charge, which is entirely possible. You don't have to like the guy in charge, but some people do. The reason is because of the fake news. See, fake news is not new. I mean, the Iraq war was fought on the basis of fake news of newspapers which call themselves you know real and genuine and the fake news is something which has been extremely troubling i mean fake news has led to lynchings and so on here we haven't spoken about the lynching but the thing is that uh, it is you know oh, actually this whole uh, hindutva project it's trying to carve out a pol political majority from a society that doesn't have a majority. Every Indian actually is a member of a minority in some way, caste or ethnicity or religion or language. Every one of us is actually a minority. So you're trying to make, to confect a majority. And the inclusion as well as the exclusion results in a great deal of violence. You Horrible! Whore wife, huh? Did you bang my whore wife? Does anybody here have any illegitimate children with my whore? Said Pop. So to recap what she just said, she is saying that every Indian is basically a minority, and therefore there's no need for them to come together for, uh, you know, national cooperation in any sort of way. I isn't it ri ridiculous? I mean, look at the way that these people relate to, on CBC, to ideas like the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, look at the way people relate to these La Raza movements over in the Southwest. Look at the way they relate to some of these organizations like the ADL that claim to represent all of the Jews. And then they suddenly want to, they, they feature this lady, I guess, so it's her opinion. But why does she think that the people of India can't come together and make a decision on a national basis that's possibly, you know, adverse to her views. Maybe it's because she can't accept that people think a different way. Publicly that you're often called an anti-national. Why, why, why are you called that? Why am I called that? Yeah. Well, I've been called that since anybody who disagrees, I mean, now anyone who disagrees, now of course it's not just me. Now it's like anyone who doesn't vote for Modi is a Pakistani. I mean, the most terrifying thing about this election is that while people like me and individuals are talking about the lynchings, are talking about communism, no political party has because everybody is frightened of losing the Hindu vote, right? So everybody is, 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 is sort of tiptoeing around what is really sitting there and looking at you in absolute horror. You whore! Troy is well known as a published author around the world, but in India, she's essentially glommed on with every single type of movement that has opposed a real central national Hindu or Indian identity. So it's well known that she goes and uh, pals along with the Naxalites, who are the Maoist guerrillas in India. She's very much, she has no problem with them. For some reason, they don't have to be individual minorities because they are the right type of people to come together. She's also defended this guy, Muhammad Abdal Guru, who's, who's dead. He was uh, executed a few years ago. And he was the person who pulled out the 2001 Indian Parliament attack, which left 14 people dead, including five perpetrators. So this is a type of person who the CBC is interviewing concerning the, the 
worrying attributes of Narendra Modi being reelected by the major the vast majority of Indians. <laughs> Now we're going to go look at somebody who, now I, I couldn't find a video from the Young Turks, but I could find a video from the discount Young Turks, The Real News. Victory for the BJP means five more years of a Hindu fundamentalist government in India, and many worry that the damage already done in the last five years can be irrecoverable and that the Muslim minority for a non-secular state could suffer for so i want you guys to go this is a homework assignment go to the real news website and type in pakistan and try to find any article a single article where they bring light to the plight of christians in pakistan or hindus in pakistan or sikhs in pakistan or any religious minority in pakistan and if you can find one you know I guess I guess you're a really cool dude, but because there isn't any, they don't care about the plight of non-Muslim minorities in Muslim countries. But for some reason, they're obsessed with the plight of Muslims in India. And th let me be clear about this: it's not as if I'm some booster for Hinduism. I'm just trying to say that why are they so obsessed with what's going on in india of all places where the government has for the most part preserved more civil liberties if if they have them okay i i wouldn't say india is like the most open and and um legally transparent country of you know they, they certainly have a lot of corruption issues but suddenly you know they they grow this this huge heart on for the minorities in India, which has more religious minorities than, than most countries around the world. For the next five years as well. Now, joining me to discuss all of this is Vijay Prasad. He's the director of the Tricontinental Institute for Social Research. He's the chief editor of... Le Isn't it funny they always seem to find these Marxists? Okay, a Marxist intellectual over at, uh, you know, apparently Trinity College in Hartford. So for some reason you have these filthy Marxists Keep your you whore. that seem to get these gigs with, with American universities and then they want to pass judgment on the countries they came from that don't want Marxism. The people in India don't want Marxism, you skeevy bastard. Keep your you whore. Left word books and he's also the editor of the book Strongmen. Putin, Erdogan, Duterte, Trump, and Modi. Good to have you here, Vijay. Thanks a lot. All right, Vijay. Now, many in the mainstream media outlets are, of course, reporting this landslide victory for the BJP and Narendra Modi. And, of course, by now, we all on the left, Congress and uh, others, have to concede uh, to what happened. But how do you characterize this victory? What happened? Well, it's, uh, it's a long story, and it's not a pleasing story for me because I uh, don't think it's a good idea for India to have such a long period with the Bharatiya Janata Party led by Narendra Modi as the prime minister to have them in the government. I think it's going to be very difficult for India in the next five years. I mean, she probably went right from the clinic and banged some guy and got knocked up because your mother was a giant whore. But I must say that uh, both in terms of a certain kind of institutional collapse and in terms of the very smart campaign run by Mr. Modi, uh, this is, you know, something that people should have been able to anticipate. Uh, when I say institutional collapse, you know, I'd like to emphasize, Sharmini, that this is not a story that can only be explained in terms of details of Indian society or what happened in this election campaign. In other words, this is not something that begs an empirical explanation. You know, just before the Indian election, there was the turn to the right in Australia. The right wing wins again. Uh, we know that the right has been gaining in Europe, and we'll see what happens in this European parliamentary election. But certainly, the story in India is not unusual. It's something... So look, I want you guys to put this into the context 
of where this guy is sitting and where the world is going. He's sitting in a nice book-lined room in Connecticut. Keep your you voice whore! And he's complaining about countries that are choosing against Marxism. Okay, why don't you just just screw off, okay? The fact is that if you go around the world, people are choosing of their own volition to embrace their country's traditional heritage. And no, I personally am not a nationalist. I, I'm much more of a libertarian, a free marketer. Uh, I believe in civil liberties. Not all of these leaders, I mean, certainly not Duterte, believe in civil liberties. But the reason that so many of these nationalist leaders have uh, basically r r risen up and taken the reins of their countries and are starting to stamp out the, the, the degenerate hordes of losers is because of people like the guy that you're seeing here. He didn't say why India is headed for ruin under Narendra Modi because it's not headed for ruin. In fact, you could probably say that they're doing much better than they were under the Congress party. And, and by the way, I want you guys to realize that if the results hadn't been this way and the Indian National Congress with Rahul Gandhi had gotten into power, they would have been making up other complaints about them. They would have been talking about how they're neoliberals or how they're globalists or whatever. You know what, dude? I don't believe you, Frank, all right? You tell her she's a goddamn whore. But in this case, it's like the glass, uh, you know, with that, it would have been the glass is half empty. With this case, it's like the, the glass has a few drops left in it and the, those drops are going to evaporate due to climate change. This is why I can't abide by these leftist filthy pigs just using our country as a basis to criticize other countries that freely choose to reject Marxism. Thing that has been repeated elsewhere. Um, you know, what I would like us to consider is that there's been a sort of hollowing out of democracy. And I'm going to give you three quick examples from the Indian case. So when we lose an election, it's the hollowing out of democracy. That's, that's the code. That's the code, guys. The first is an immense amount of money was spent on this campaign. You know, something to the tune of $7 billion. Uh, just to put this in context, in the 2000... Mr. President, after I destroy Washington, D.C., I will destroy another major city every hour on the hour. That is, unless, of course, you pay me $100 billion. <laughs> 2016 United States election, the total amount spent on the presidential campaign and the congressional seat that, that year was six and a half billion. In this Indian election, seven billion dollars was spent that we know of. So uh, the, the, the thing is that there is 1.3 billion people, I believe, in India. And in America, we only have like 350 million. So why is this surprising? A lot of so-called black money was also spent in it for sure. So this was, you know, an unbelievably expensive election and money plays a role. Second thing that's, I think, important for people to focus on is that the Indian media has completely collapsed in terms of its ability to hold politicians accountable. You know, Mr. Modi ran in 2014 on an agenda. He hadn't been able to meet the expectations or deliver on his agenda. He was not questioned about that. The media didn't ask about that. You know, and that's a real failure. The media should hold politicians to account for what they said they would do. But there was almost no media challenge to Mr. Modi. <laughs> Finally, in terms of the kind of institutional collapse, the election commission in India was asleep on the job. I mean, it allowed Mr. Modi and his party to routinely break the customary obligations of political parties, for instance, not to use religion uh, in the in the uh, election campaign. Election. Oh, I can't talk about things that I care about. That's that should be the uh, you know these people. They're basically the most useless rags that you could ever find.
Keep your you voice whore! Okay, maybe we should make a rule that you can't use communist re retardation in your or in your election propaganda. Should that be a rule? The commission didn't wrap the BJP or Mr. Modi on the knuckles. It did question other parties. So it's not like you know they decided to go to sleep on the job as far as everyone was concerned. In this sense, there was an institutional failure. Money, the media, and then the election commission. This is a situation one sees not just in India, but I think in other parts of the world. And Modi made the most of it. I mean, he ran a far-right campaign using national security as the principal uh, you know, message of his campaign. And basically... Yes, uh, how, how dare he use national security? India is never attacked by any other country. So I think we've had enough of this. You can watch the full videos. They will be in the comments in case you think I've left something out that you feel was bur 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 worth repeating. But I want you guys to realize that this is the face of left-wing filth, okay? This, not this, this. Four. <laughs> so you see these people, they fucking lost. Get over it, you assholes, and just realize the reason that you live in Connecticut is because Americans are dumb enough to give you a job explaining your failed ideas that you weren't able to, to sell to your friends back at home. That's about it. As you well know, please like, share, and subscribe. Also subscribe to me on Minds.com. You can find me there at Chef Leopard. I'm trying to put together a group in order to do notifications and possibly work on other bigger projects. So at Chef Leopard on Minds, at Chef Leopard on BitChute, and also at Chef Leopard on Subscribestar if you want to contribute. And also, if you want to follow me on Gab, it's at Starscream85. And have a great day recovering from that butt hurt if you're a Marxist.
माया के हाथी को यहाँ पे रोकेगा कौन मोदी 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 बनारस वालों मुझे पहचानो गुजरात से आया मैं मोदी मैं मोदी मैं मोदी मैं हूँ मैं हूँ मैं मोदी छप्पन इंच कसीना जिसका दुश्मन के छक्के छुड़ा दे जो ओ मैं ही हूँ ओ मैं ही हूँ पीएम का सपना लिए सीएम की हैट्रिक लगाए जो ओ मैं ही हूँ अडवाणी ने माना है राजनाथ ने ठाना है अब मुझको टो कौन बनारस वालों मुझे पहचानो गुजरात से आया मैं मोदी मैं मोदी मैं मोदी मैं हूं मैं हूं मैं मोदी